right. Here we so, go. <laughs> right. All right. I am Taylor Guthrie. So I'm a social neuroscientist. I'm a fifth year PhD. So I'm right kind of at the, the end of my program. But I love everything about the brain um, and especially kind of the social processes involved with the brain, kind of group dynamics, how we relate to one another. So, Dad, you want to introduce yourself, Andrew? Yeah, I'm Andrew. Uh, I'm I run the the channel Sense of Mind. I'm a uh, science communicator, neuroscience, psychology. Um, just really into everything about the mind and brain, and try to give people a good picture of how that works. And uh, yeah, that's kind of my mission. Yeah. And so we decided to start this podcast because we both have our, our own channels. So my channel is the, the Cellular Republic, uh, teaching about how the brain works and kind of looking at kind of social neuroscience, things like that. And we actually met through YouTube, which was kind of cool. Uh, I think that kind of inspired in a way the, the name of the, the podcast that were two kind of brainy people getting together to talk about the brain, but pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I think we met through probably through the comment section on one of your yep. videos. I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we've done uh, we've done some interviews together uh, in the past, and we decided that it was it was a good idea to just have a space to have conversations about some some really interesting stuff, some stuff that I think that a lot of people can find impactful in their own lives. Um, something that, that I run into a lot, and I'm sure that you can kind of relate to this, Andrew, is that a lot of people think that the brain is really complicated. Uh, my view on that is that doing brain science tends to be pretty complicated, but the stuff that we learn about it can actually be distilled down into really useful and easy to understand stuff. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. Um, for the most part, I think there's like <laughs> things like you get, you get down into the weeds of, of molecular neurobiology and it starts to become a little bit more yeah. difficult to see how it applies but i think you're right like a, a lot of times it's it's made too complicated or it's not communicated in a way that is useful to people and i think like that's what we're trying to do that's what we're going to try to do here right <laughs> yeah. so i uh, i think the, the coolest thing about all of this is that we want this to be a platform where we can talk about uh, a lot of different angles about this kind of stuff. Uh, the, the social brain itself kind of implies that we will be talking a lot about kind of social brain processes. But uh, I think one of the coolest things about social neuroscience is that it involves everything, right? It involves attention. It involves decision making. It involves memory. Uh, so I want this to be a platform where we can really dive into a lot of these different brain processes. Uh, but also, I, I think, too, the, the the title of the social brain also implies that we can look at society. We can look at the fact that society itself is an organism, and that we're all individual cells within that, uh, and look at kind of how we're kind of creating a brain of the human species, the social brain. Absolutely. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, the caveat is we're, we're going to be probably presenting a lot of what sound like wild ideas and what are a lot of them are pretty crazy, but they're like, this is a way for us to explore some of these, both the, the hard neuroscience as well as what Taylor, what you were just saying, like individual cells and how that relates to society and social dynamics and group dynamics and all that. And so we're going to try to kind of in this series, like draw a, a bigger picture that, may or may not always be 100% supported by by the empirical evidence. We're never going to say anything that goes against yeah. the evidence, but we're going to kind of uh, be exploring these ideas in like a, a looser way than maybe we normally do in our in our kind of, especially in, in Taylor's lecture videos, which if you guys <laughs> haven't seen him, uh, go to his channel and watch those because they're university level lectures on social neuroscience. Really awesome stuff. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. And so and I, I, I really like that, that kind of sentiment. Like I want this to be a place where we can look at different levels of analysis. We can explore biology, we can explore neuroscience, and we can explore society in general. Look at all of these like group dynamics, these influences that we have on other people, that other people have on us, and really try to connect all of these different things together and see how they fit, how our biology informs the, the neuroscience principles and how the neuroscience principles inform the way that we connect with other people. So right. uh, 
I think uh, diving in, so today's episode is uh, really about life being a social process uh, and looking at kind of across the spectrum, how every little piece about life in some way involves interaction with other living things. And so yeah. I was thinking maybe uh, maybe we can zoom in a little bit and look at the cellular world, because that's something that's always fascinated me. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I got into neuroscience, uh, I always saw that there was something about life being left out of biology, that when when you read these textbooks, when you look at all of these descriptions of all of these different molecules and everything, that there was there was something missing, the interactions between these things that were living beings that in some way have their own autonomy, right? These cells are, uh, they, they strive to stay alive, right? They interact with other living things. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And um, I mean, I think that that we we can kind of look at this as as you're saying, like life is this this social process, this kind of dynamic process um, where like individual cells are interacting with one another in a, a social way. Um, but I think another way that we can kind of frame this, that if if that doesn't quite make sense to people, is um, that life is a a complex system. And that's like an actual uh, technical term. And so I, I have this like definition from um, from David Krakauer, who's the the president of the Santa Fe Institute, and they study uh, complexity. And um, and basically, he says about complex systems, these are phenomena that we study as complex systems, the convoluted exhibitions of the adaptive world from cells to societies. Examples of these include cities, economies, civilizations, the nervous system, the internet, and ecosystems. So I think like that that um, framework of where we're we're looking at this like dynamic interaction among the individual components of a system that that those interactions create this emergent behavior, yeah. and that's what we're what we call life. Like in the case of of cells and their interactions with one another. And even within individual um, bacterial cells, what what we're calling life is this this emergent behavior of the system that arises from these complex dynamics of the, the components interacting. And each of these cells is communicating in some way. And this is becoming uh, very prevalent in kind of the, the biological uh, language is talking about these cells as having communications with one another in kind of molecular terms. Uh, when you really think about language, and I'd love to do kind of a, a full episode on language in the future, our version of language as human beings is this auditory thing that we're communicating ideas. But uh, in the long run, what language allows us to do is coordinate behavior right? Um, there was a, a biologist that, that used this metaphor that was, that was fascinating. He said, if you were in a helicopter and you were flying over a swimming pool and you looked down and you saw this colorful thing that all of a sudden was a circle and then it was a star and then it was like a rectangle or whatever, you'd be kind of perplexed. You're like, what is this colorful thing down in the swimming pool? But as you get closer and you see that it's actually a bunch of uh, synchronized swimmers, that are doing these, these fascinating combinations with their legs and with their arms, uh, instead of being perplexed, you'd say, how are these individuals coordinating their activity and creating these amazing emergent patterns when all the individuals really have is the interactions with the people right next to them, right? The individuals can't actually see the full picture, but somehow there are these just ingenious rules built into the system that allow this coordination and this, this behavior to actually emerge in the first place. Um, and I think that when you're really thinking about dynamic systems, uh, dynamic systems are really hard to predict what the individuals are going to do. But I think that there are some clear rules that kind of dictate what kind of emergent property you can expect out of those individual interactions. Yeah, yeah. And that's that this idea of like spontaneous order or self-organization mm -hmm. where this this overall behavior of the system in in the case of the the swimmers you know the shapes that yeah. they're creating in the pool um emerges like you said just from these relatively simple interactions among the individuals um just doing you know maybe extending their arms and or doing whatever i've never right. synchronized swim before so i have <laughs> no idea but um 
but yeah, and I think that is that is something to keep in mind. And you could think of it in terms of um, when it comes to biology, like the uh, even just the movement of a human body is the result of of trillions of interactions among oh. cells, uh, just doing fairly simple things, passing molecules, uh, you know, contracting uh, muscles. Mm -hmm. Do, that if you were at the level of the cell, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell what's going on. It would only be when you zoom out to that yeah. bigger level that you'd be able to see that. That you see lungs absorbing oxygen and spreading them through an entire like vast network of cardiovascular vessels. Like, uh, I mean, that's something that has always just like fascinated me is the fact that we're created out of these billions and billions of cells that each have the same genetic components, right? Every single one of them has the same genome, but they express that genome differently depending on the, the population of cells that they're embedded in. Um, and something that's really fascinating when you look at kind of embryology, which is the study of how we develop from an embryo into a, a fully functioning like organism with tissues and organ systems and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, they did these really interesting studies where they would separate the, the two cells. So when the embryo first divided into two cells, they would separate the two of them and they would kind of let them do their own thing. Uh, they would also like explant cells from one stage into another. But what they found essentially was that it didn't matter when you what you did and how you separated this. What mattered was the populations of cells that were influencing how the thing developed. So a cell is only going to turn into a muscle cell if it's surrounded by other cells that are sending signals that we need to become muscle cells, right? If you take a cell out, if you explant a cell from a tissue, it'll actually revert back to kind of a, a proto stem cell like thing. Like there's something inherent about being embedded in this social environment that allows the cell to actually be what it's supposed to be. Yeah. And then that's that's really interesting because, I mean, there was this research, um, I don't know, it was years ago, but this uh, this idea of induced pluripotent stem cells. So mm -hmm. not only can you um, watch that process happen where uh, where cells influence each other to turn into different kinds of cells, but scientists have figured out uh, how to take an, a mature cell and give it the right factors, the right molecules yeah. and chemicals um, and turn it back into a stem cell. So it's there's there these these things can go in either direction, really, I guess. And that's, I mean, essentially what you're talking about is a form of language, right? We're communicating with that cell in some way. We're giving it signals that say, like, this is kind of what you're supposed to be and where you're supposed to go. Uh, there's other uh, instances, too, where, like, if you, um, if you have cells kind of in a Petri dish, right, uh, they've noticed that the cells won't actually grow. They won't proliferate. They won't divide unless they're surrounded by other cells. If you take one out or if you take a couple out, those will just kind of just go off and die on their own. I think that says something. I mean, something that I love and the reason I think we're starting by talking about cells in a, in a podcast about kind of the social brain um, is that there are these amazing similarities between kind of the social structure of these individual cells and the social structure that we see emerge kind of on this grand scale of, of humankind, right? And so maybe taking a, a look at uh, evolution for a second, um, if we want to kind of take that route. Yeah. So my, my, my thought it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting because, uh, I think this is why I, I got into science in the first place. I had these, like these kind of realizations that there were these really cool, um, similarities between the evolution of the organism and the evolution of society. Right. Uh, one of the ones that really stood out to me at first, especially since we're kind of talking about language and about cells communicating with one another, was the evolution of communication in kind of the cellular landscape, right? So you start with these really, um, these small colonies of cells. Uh, bacterial cells uh, ended up becoming the multicellular organisms that we see today. But uh, it was all cell-to-cell -cell communication at first. It was all individual cells just sending signals to the cells right next to them. Right. And that's very similar when you look at like tribal communication. Right. The first tribes of people, the only communication that was happening was person to person. Right. But as the system becomes more complex, so as these tribes start to discover and contact other tribes and become kind of more 
fast civilizations, right, as the organism starts to develop and starts to differentiate and have different tissues, you now have a need for communication between different groups, right? You have this tissue that's made up of all of these kind of cells, and you have this tissue that's made up of different cells, but they have to coordinate in some way. And this is where kind of hormone transmission kind of came on board, right? You have these signals that are being sent from one group of cells to the other, and it's very similar to the like the um, the Pony Express, right? Sending this this letter on horseback from your community to another one. The whole idea is that there's this time lapse that happens, right? Hormone transmission is really slow. Something needs to happen, but it takes a while for that hormone to get all the way to that other group of cells. And it's the same with like delivering a letter. It's like we need something, but it takes that entire time of that person traveling to that other community. But then you see the next stage in the evolution was uh, was electrical transmission, right? And so what we see is this, this need that arose for coordination among these things that were becoming more and more complex. And electrical transmission now allowed for this amazingly fast coordination of like almost instantaneously, right? And it's the same with now we have, we have radios, we have cell phones, we have all of these kind of things that now allow us as human beings to coordinate in incredibly complex ways, right? Yeah. And this is the whole idea behind like the name of my channel, The Cellular Republic, is looking at how the mind actually evolved out of a need for governance in a way, right? You have all of these these different communities of cells that are all in a way they're cooperating with one another, but they're also competing with one another, right? They all need their own resources. Uh, and out of that, you needed some system that was able to coordinate all of that, that was able to allocate resources, that was able to understand what was going on in the external world and make decisions for the community as a whole. Um, and I, I really think that's like the purpose of the mind is this kind of governing force of the body. Yeah, it's, that's something I've been thinking about a lot because we have talked about this, that idea before. And I, I really like the comparison between uh, human social life and, and what cells are doing. And I think it's, it's really, uh, really good. Although there's one place where I, I've started to realize that I might, I might tweak it a little bit. Um, yeah. And it would be that I think that you're, you're completely right to say that the, the nervous system is kind of like this electrical communications system that has like arisen in, in multiple forms with um, whether it's uh, radio and, and television or telephones and, and the internet. Um, yeah. I think that is a really good analogy for what the brain is doing. It's transferring and uh, it's transferring information. It's, it's, uh, it's also uh, allowing for communication among various parts of the body, but it's also kind of uh, storing information and, and making decisions. Um, but I think that it, it maybe isn't the best, the, the government may not be the very best uh, analogy for it, only because I think that the, the real primary function of government is like protection of um, individual individual rights and i would say that that the immune system kind of seems to fulfill that role uh in the same way that like police and military do in human societies it serves this this protective role um this differentiation from of self from from other um and uh and that that i think you're right to say that the the nervous system is coordinating everything, but I think it's doing it in a way similar to how our whole network of, of just communications infrastructure in human societies does it, which is by uh, communication among individuals with intermediates between them. So like uh, the, the heart has to, to pump blood when like the muscles need it as a really simplistic mm -hmm. example, but it it goes kind of goes through the brain and there's complex feedback loops between the organs and the brain. Um, and it's not necessarily just a top-down control from the brain. No, I absolutely. I think um, one of the interesting things that you point out here, and I think something that I, I really anchor on a lot is the idea of decision-making, right? And the flow of information. So 
we, I mean, I, I think something Freud gets a lot of flack in like the psychology world, but I think something that he was, was really kind of profound with was this idea of the unconscious um, because our awareness is, is only of a very small fraction of all of this, this amazing complexity that we have in our body. These, like you mentioned earlier, just moving a, a muscle is trillions of interactions, right? And so what I see, the reason I, I, I kind of use governance as this, this metaphor uh, is looking at the idea of the flow of information up to the top. And if you look at how someone who is running a government, the kind of information that they have access to is very similar to the kind of information that our consciousness has access to, right? Like the person running a country does not have access to how the, the individual components of the health healthcare system are interacting with one another, how the police force is doing their job. They have just information which is usually in the form, especially in today's world, in the form of media, right? And I think that our attention mechanisms kind of are like the media in, in, our, in our body. They're pulling out just information, right? They're pulling out like, what are the really important things that are happening right now? I just stubbed my toe. Oh my gosh, there was this crazy violent thing that happened in this community of cells down in my toe. Like that's like headline news right now. And that informs my decision-making process, right? And so whatever information is brought to awareness is the information that has been packaged in a way that is like being brought to like the king or the CEO of a company or whatever is like, okay, these are the most important things that we're facing right now. Now it's your responsibility to make these decisions. And that's something that I, I lean on a lot um, that I probably am going to talk about throughout the series is this sense of responsibility that this gives us as individuals, right? If we view ourselves, our awareness, our consciousness um, as being kind of the leader of these billions and billions of cells that we're essentially in charge of or responsible for, uh, it, it shifts the responsibility to us to put in the work, to make sure that we're, we're making healthy decisions, to make sure that, that we're, we're doing the right things, right? It's very different than um, a lot of what the culture had, had built in, especially around kind of this these religious ideas of uh, things are happening to you because you're a bad person and like God is punishing you. That takes the responsibility away from you. But if we can shift it back and we can say, OK, our body is giving us signals. Our body is telling us certain things about our energy levels, about our fatigue, about how healthy we are. And it's delivering that in the form of this headline news to the person in charge, to the awareness, the consciousness. And we then in that moment have to make a decision about whether we're going to listen to those signals or whether we're going to act selfishly some like some authoritarian government would. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because it's it seems like the the brain in some ways are we, we it acts only in its own like according to its own interests, really, like yeah. the, 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 the toe may be hurting, um, <laughs> but it like the brain only really cares about that because of the consequences of what's going to happen. If, if the toe is broken, I, I won't be able to <laughs> right? satisfy my desires in some other way. And, and so now I need to like pay attention to this and take care of it. And um, like, it always seems to come back to like the brains, the, it's like a brain centric thing but i i mean it has the effect of taking care of the the whole body for sure but just a kind of a observation there yeah. no no that's that's really interesting and so i uh, i think the the interesting is as we zoom out right so now we have these uh, incredible multicellular organisms um that whole process as i mean we're talking millions and millions of years uh multiple mass extinctions right we've gone through what, at least six or seven mass extinctions that it extinguished like 97% of the species on the earth. Um, that whole process was all this like incredibly social process. All of these organisms were all interacting with one, one another in certain ways. They were all striving to stay alive. And that kind of promoted this either cooperation or competition thing that kind of unfolded across the landscape that is a very social thing, right? Uh, and that's interesting is like kind of what you said. And I think something I, I kind of wanted to, to delve into a little bit is this difference between individuality and like collectiveness, right? Uh, when we're talking about cells, like we mentioned at the beginning that these individual cells, they have their own kind of 
autonomy, right? They are essentially making decisions. Uh, I wouldn't call them like very complex decisions, but I, I think, I personally think that cells um, are sentient to a certain extent. They know that they're alive and want to stay alive. Um, and they have their own personal goals to stay alive. But there's also this group goal. There's the organism, like what the organism needs and what the organism is kind of imparting on that individual. And it's the same in society, right? We each have, each of us have our own individual goals, but then we're also part of groups or part of our family group or part of our friend group, the leisure groups, we're part of the society that we're a part of. And our individual goals are usually in some way in competition with these groups that we're a part of. Um, and it's ultimately, I think that's where like, group and group dynamics is really interesting is balancing those. Um, and I think that's something that society has faced for a long time is how do we, how do we promote these group goals and get everybody on board? The organism does that really well. Um, but, um, but how do we still respect kind of individual autonomy? Yeah. Well, I, I would, I guess I would first, uh, kind of challenge the, the idea that the, the cells are sentient if if by sentience we mean like uh you know capable of some kind of subjective experience consciousness yeah. um because i think that's where that's kind of where the the analogy where like the rubber meets the road because mm -hmm. to me the 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 moral component comes in at the level of the the individual organism the individual or like sorry the the individual person um because we we are capable of of suffering and well-being and um when it's at the level of the individual cell it doesn't matter like there's not that it doesn't i don't care if a cell my skin cell dies you know um it doesn't really matter to me uh and i think that that's like a very important distinction because um you know organisms, multicellular organisms can act in a way where all of the individual's uh, goals are completely subservient to the the collective's goals. And I think that's why they're, I mean, that is why they are able to, to act in such a well-coordinated way, um, because their their goals are fundamentally aligned with the, the survival and well-being of the collective. Um, and I think that stems from the fact that they're all literally clones of each other. They're, your <laughs> cells are just trillions yeah. of clones. And, um, and so they, they've evolved over hundreds of, you know, millions of years to be uh, basically components like gears in this system. Uh, whereas humans, like we are kind of fundamentally have different goals than one another. And I think that the the way that we have to come to cooperate is to basically like respect each other's uh, <laughs> individual rights, and um, and I think like that allows for cooperation to emerge. There's going to be competition among groups, but fundamentally, like our interactions with each other are are most often going to be cooperative, even if we are just following our own self-interest for the most part. I don't know. What do you so, think of that? Yeah. So I have a couple of, couple of points. So uh, the first thing you brought up was, was sentience. And I, it's, it's hard to throw these words around, especially like sentience, consciousness. Uh, I mean, it's something that I want to put out as like a caveat from the, from the get go is that uh, these metaphors, looking at things as being social, like a, the cellular sociology or whatever, um, they're, they're metaphors, right? They they help us to understand these phenomenons. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily real, right? Uh, we want to avoid this kind of gratuitous anthropomorphism. We want we don't want to give like human qualities to these cells that don't have the ability to have cognition like we do. Uh, but what I see is there. I what I believe is that there is some form of like basal cognition right? That individual cells have a form of cognition. And you can see this at the, in, the ter in terms of like bacterial cells experience Pavlovian learning, right? You can put uh, a rod with stuff on it uh, and uh, tie it to some kind of a cue and uh, 
I don't remember like the full details, but there's tons of studies about bacterial cells being like able to be influenced by Pavlovian conditioning. And there's also these, these studies where they look at how if you take these two individual cells that are healthy cells um, and you have them on a Petri dish and they're kind of moving around trying to find each other, when they come into contact with one another, they will like stop for a moment and they'll like communicate a little bit and then they'll kind of move away. Cancer cells don't do that. Cancer cells will just like crawl all over each other without mm. any kind of like respect to the other one. What that kind of says to me is that there's something about the, the interactions themselves. There's something about those individual cells having a certain type of cognition, a certain type of being alive. I think that's what I really mean by sentience. There was uh, a quote from, I think it was from the Upanishads and I'm probably butchering it, but it was uh, the first thing that ever came into existence was immediately afraid. Um, and I don't necessarily like the word afraid because we can't really like put fear onto these things. Uh, but what it said to me was that there's a driving force behind life, right? That living things don't want to die. And it it creates this, uh, you kind of hear about this in like existential philosophy. I think Schopenhauer was, was really big talking about this needless striving that all living things have, this striving to accomplish things. Um, and you can kind of look at it in terms of like hierarchies, right? So really simple organisms, the striving is all based around survival needs. It's all based around these physiological things about maintaining our, our nutrient state and like making sure that we have connections with these other things around us. Um, I think that you're entirely correct and kind of moving to one of your other points uh, in terms of cells within an organism being in a very authoritarian type uh, <laughs> Uh, t type society, right? Because they've essentially lost a lot of their individuality, right? And that's this whole idea between collectivism and individualism um, is that there are certain instances where a society is able to remove the individuality from the, the people that are kind of creating that system. And they shed those that individuality in replacement for the group's goals, right? And you pointed out something really important in the fact that they're clones. So when you look at the evolution of multicellular uh, um, organisms, right, the, the very early stages from going from single cells to this like differentiated, like different tissues, uh, being able to replicate all of this, there are these things called slime molds where they, all of the cells, there's these huge colonies of, of bacterial cells. And all of the individual cells in a slime mold are kind of connected to one another in a way. They're sharing information, uh, but there's no differentiation. There's no, they haven't figured out how to, what they call export fitness. Like I'm going to take care of protecting the organism. You take care of digestion, right? Uh, and what they think the reason for that was, was because these, these colonies of bacterial cells were not clones. And so they had free rider problems where they had cells that were just sitting around, just like raking in the benefits of being in this colony without doing anything. And they also had deserters because of the fact that they weren't clones. The first, they think that the first actual multicellular organisms were clonal colonies. And it was because of the fact that each of those cells was on kind of the same goal. They had the same thing in mind. They were, they were all trying to achieve the same thing. Um, and that's kind of like blowing back up to kind of the, the societal level. Um, that is something that's it's really prevalent in our society is this tension between individual goals and collective goals. And what's really interesting as humans is that we have language, right? We don't have to be clones with one another because we can actually communicate our rights to one another. We can create these complex symbols that represent why you shouldn't be a free rider, why you shouldn't desert this colony. We can actually create entire messages and visions about why we should be in this group in the first place, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's that's really cool because, I mean, when you're talking about the, the cognition of an individual cell, I think we could, like, drill into that a little bit because I, I agree. I think... Um, it's, it's a good way of thinking about it. Like a, a cell is basically kind of like this little, I don't know. It, I mean, and, and it is its own little organism. And mm -hmm. uh, when we say like cognition and what we're talking about is these, these set of, of biochemical pathways um, really relating ultimately to that, that cell's DNA. 
um, and, and its precise sequence of DNA and how, um, when it finds itself in a certain environment, how those mechanisms play out and influence its behavior. And so like, that's kind of, I think what we mean by, by cognition in a cell. And I think you're making a really good point because as, as individuals with these big brains, we can think explicitly about these ideas of, of rights or, or whatever it is. And, um, and, and it's kind of like this, we create this shared cognition, this, this culture really, um, that, uh, serves the role that the, the shared DNA of the, the, uh, bacteria or sorry, of, of your, your cells in your body have, it kind of replicates mm -hmm. that role to some extent. The only thing I was going to mention is there's this, uh, cause you said the, the first, uh, multicellular organisms may have been clonal colonies. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not really sure how this relates to the evolution of multicellular organisms, but I remember reading about this really cool, um, I think, I guess it's a bacteria, um, but it's, oh, it's a protozoan. It's called Mixatrica paradoxa. And it's <laughs> really cool. All. It's, yeah, it's got, so this is from Wikipedia, but I'll just read it. It says, it is composed of five different organisms. Three bacterial ectosymbionts live on its surface for locomotion, and at least one endosymbiont lives inside to help digest digest cellulose in wood to produce acetate for its host. So not, and then in addition to that, so it's got all these organisms, it's got bacteria that serve, I believe, as like the joints of its, of its arms or whatever yeah. you call them, it, podia, I think they're called. <laughs> and then, um, and then it has its own like microbiome inside to help it digest the cellulose from wood. But why does it need to do that? Because it itself is a bacteria living in the digestive system of termites. So oh, it's geez. like this just Russian doll of like right? uh, organisms <laughs> going down. And I wonder if, you know, and then thinking about us, we also have a microbiome that is uh, really important for our health and everything. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it's, if it's possible that, that different animal, different organisms could have evolved to, into this sort of cooperative arrangement, um, even if they weren't the same, uh, like from the same clonal colony. And another, sorry, I know I'm going yeah, no, on here, no, but yeah, um, <laughs> another example of that is within all of our cells, we have uh, mitochondria. Mitochondria mm -hmm. are these little organelles that produce basically all of the energy for your entire body. They they convert, you know, um, carbohydrates and uh, um, oxygen and water into um, energy, ATP for your body. And it's thought that these mitochondria were these, originally these um, microcellular or these uh, microbes, these little bacteria basically. And that at some point it like it absorbed itself into or was absorbed by a larger bacteria, uh, which was kind of like the precursor of all uh, eukaryotic cells, yep. all of our cells. And so like that original kind of like social uh, evolutionary arrangement has led to what are, how we are today, I guess. <laughs> and I think, I think you're getting into something really interesting and that's the, the idea of the degree of complexity, right? And so there are these situations where you can have these different organisms kind of like that aren't clones, right? Uh, kind of coming together in this symbiotic way to help each other. But I don't think that those types of symbiotic relationships allow you to achieve the kind of complexity that we see with like cardiovascular systems and the liver and the, the immune system and all of these incredibly complex things that I think needed some type of kind of uh, every cell on the same page kind of thing to get to. Uh, and I think the underlying uh, idea here is, I, I mentioned the term earlier, it's this idea called exportation of fitness. Right. So when you're in a, a group and so we can look at this in terms of human groups, we can look at this in terms of biology. Uh, the ultimate goal as you're becoming more complex is to spread the workload. Right. Like when you're a small, not super complex uh, thing, each individual is responsible for their own everything. Right. Right. 
every single cell has to uh, digest their own food. They have to protect themselves. They have to do all of these different things themselves. Exportation of fitness is saying, okay, I'm going to take on this role. I'm going to be the protector. I'm going to form this, this lining around the organism. But in order to do that, I have to lose all of the ability to digest food. That's really energy intensive, right? But now you have all of these cells that are in the middle of that colony that don't have to protect themselves, that can now lose that ability and just digest food and can send those nutrients back out to the, the, the ones on the outside that are protecting the organism, right? And the really cool idea when you're looking at that in terms of society, right? Uh, something that's fascinating about language is that we're now able to communicate exportation of fitness, right? Instead of actually having to have this biological process where like I've lost the ability to do something and uh, we're now in this position that you look at like tribes and the, the growing uh, societies, I can say, I'm going to do this job. You go do that job. Right. Yeah. And I think that what we're seeing is that this this whole like evolution into this really complex multicellular organisms required this this really kind of like everyone on the same page, this authoritarian type view. But now we're able to create what looks like a multicellular organism, society, right? We have roads that look like cardiovascular systems. We have a healthcare system that looks like an immune system, right? We have all of these, like, and you mentioned earlier, like the police system, like all of these incredible systems, like we, we harvest our own food and we spread all of those nutrients out in the form of supermarkets, right? We're able to do that without being biologically connected to one another. And I think that that's what's so fascinating about language, about our ability to transmute these, these representations. Because what you mentioned earlier was this idea of cognition, right? Getting back to kind of this idea of basal cognition. Uh, there's this fascinating book called uh, the Evolution of Memory Systems by Elizabeth Murray, uh, where they look at evolutionarily, like, how has memory changed? And I'm kind of using memory as a, as a plug for cognition, because Ultimately, what I think cognition is, is using some type of internal representation to predict what you're going to do in the future, right? That's ultimately what Pavlovian conditioning is, right? Is that you've, you've noticed that there are, there's a connection between this bell and this food. And so now that internal representation allows you to predict when there's going to be food in the future, right? But as the organisms became more complex, as the uh, the stresses of the environment started to change, uh, there appeared new types of, of memory, like instrumental learning, where you can go around and you can just randomly try a bunch of stuff until something works. And then you can go with that, right? Then they figured out that we have the ability to have like aversive learning, which is this long-term learning, right? I can eat something that makes me sick. And I can remember that that was from something I ate hours ago, right? It's like the, the basis for this kind of long-term cognition. But we now as humans have deliberative cognition, right? We can actually take all of these internal representations that we have and we can compare them to one another. We can create these symbols. We can think about possible solutions in the future. And we can actually like simulate that whole thing and say like, uh, there's a great example that Joseph Ledoux put out. Uh, um, let's say that you're being chased by a bear and you're up in a tree, right? The really cool thing about being human is that while I'm sitting in that tree, I can think if I go for the river, I can try to swim. Hmm, I'm not a very good swimmer, so I might sink. So that's probably not a good way to go. But hmm, what if I tried to climb over to this other one? Well, I could fall. You can go through all these different scenarios, right? And so that was kind of getting back to this idea of sentience, this idea of cognition. We can't assume that these other living things are able to think like we do. But I don't think that that doesn't mean that they're not alive, right? And I think that kind of coming back to our overall kind of theme and idea of the, the episode is that life is a social process, right? It's all about communication, right? There was this whole field of reductionism of like, if we understand all of these individual components, then we're going to understand how the system works, right? There's the whole genome project. Like once we figure out what all of the genes and the DNA are, we're going to know how the entire, we're going to find all of the drugs. We're going to cure illness. We're going to do all of this stuff. Uh, but that doesn't work because in order to truly understand the system, you need to understand how all of these indiv individual pieces are communicating with one another, interacting with one another, are like having these, these incredible complex dynamics. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's so true. And I think it's like, it's good to reflect on what, what language is. And 
and why it is so important for these processes, because it's not just talking. It's not just like mm -hmm. me and you on a live chat, you know, talking about the brain. It's like what language is, is, is certain. Well, I guess what communication is really is, is uh, you know, my behavior doing something to you in a way that influences your behavior. And that sounds like yeah. too broad to, to be communication. But I think um, when, when you, when you really boil it down, that's, that's what's going on is like, I'm, I, whether I'm a bacteria or a, a multicellular organism, like my actions are going to affect your sensory apparatus in some way that's going to like feedback into your, um, your like internal uh, <laughs> cognition system and, uh, and allow you to uh, take some action uh, based on what I'm doing. And so like that does lead to what you were talking about, like basically the, the division of labor that mm -hmm. it allows us to decide like, OK, well, oh, and and all another like economic concept. Um, oh, man, I just had it in my head. But uh, <laughs> the uh, comparative advantage, basically, like I, I might be actually like better at doing this one thing. You know, if I'm a cell, maybe I'm I'm just slightly better suited to like protecting the organism or, or something like that. Whereas like you, you know, you have a few more digestive enzymes or something that allows you to uh, become, you know, the, the digestive system. Uh, but we, we only are able to kind of like, that's only turns into this big um, division of labor that allows us to like multiply the production of energy and things like that when we can communicate when we can have some sort of coordination through the system mm -hmm. uh yeah that's uh that's really interesting i think about uh so I'm, I'm a big philosophy buff i love like existential philosophy and that just kind of made me think about uh these ideas from from sartre uh this idea of facticity so it's our choices our, our choices are not free i've always hated the term free will because our our choices in society are constrained by lots of things, right? I think that we are making decisions, but I think that they're extremely constrained. And so what he talks about is this idea of facticity that we are embedded in a particular culture. We're embedded in a particular family unit, uh, in a particular religion in most cases, all of these kind of things. Uh, and we also have a particular set of skills, right? What you were saying, like, if you look at it down at the, the cellular level, like this cell, its facticity was the fact that it had different d digestive enzymes. And so it was more suited to do this thing, right? And so much of our lives, the meaning making that we do in our lives is centered around this, this exportation of fitness, this division of labor. Like, where do I fit into society? So much of the meaning that we make in our life is tied to other people, right? It's tied to uh, trying to find how this thing that I'm a part of, how is it that I fit into that? What is my job? What are my skills? What do I bring to the table? Um, and I think that's what makes a lot of this social stuff so fascinating is that we do have these, these individual desires, these individual strivings, but a lot of them are tied to this kind of group identity, this group goal of being a part of something greater than ourselves. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. It, it definitely it reminds me of, um, there's this, this theory in um, psychology called, uh, um, man, I'm, I'm not, I'm like blanking on the actual name of it, but it's basically like a theory of motivation. And it, it has to do with us having these basic psychological needs. And that like, they kind of posit that there's three of these, that there's um, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And I think it's like, as, as humans, we, we might have these, these three needs that, that kind of come together in the context of society. And like, yep. what I mean by that is um, autonomy is really important, right? So like being able to control your life, control your own choices, um, do, you know, what it is that you want to do, that's important for our, our psychological well-being. But also uh, competence, like being good at something. And then also relatedness like so being embedded in this supportive community and like being a part of that being part of something greater than yourself and it seems like uh with 
especially with the competence piece, we can kind of find things that we're good at within that larger structure or that larger societal structure that kind of allows us to also get that community piece um, because we're kind of like striving toward this shared goal, but also like we are specifically competent and good at this one thing. I mean, that's something that I mentioned in, uh, so I made a video about social neuroscience. I think that's the one that we we met because of, uh, but it was this idea that uh, a lot of researchers are are kind of proposing that uh, our, our need to be accepted, to, to belong is as strong as our, our need for, for thirst and for hunger. Like the physiological effects of being isolated are, are intense. The, the kind of like stress responses that you go through, like declines in, in memory and cognitive function, all of these kind of things. And so I think what's fascinating to me as a social neuroscientist uh, is that everything that we've just talked about has kind of um, paved the way for our brain to evolve kind of around these social processes, right? And that's why I think it's it's so fascinating to think about like uh, how so I started in memory research, right? And and I loved what I was doing. I was studying the hippocampus, but I was studying this just like really small part of the brain. And I've always been kind of more of a generalist. I want to know how all of these pieces kind of interact with one another. And I found social neuroscience and I was like, oh my God, this is it. Because everything that we've just been talking about is about how our brain has been motivated to accomplish these very social things. Right. And so our attention mechanisms are wrapped up in that. Right. We're constantly looking for any type of indication of whether we belong, whether we're recognized, whether we're appreciated. Right. Our decision making is very much influenced around all, all of these like belonging to society. Where do I fit in? All of this kind of stuff. Um, and all of our memory processes are very kind of centered around a lot of these social processes as well. And it's um, I don't think that it's a surprise that a lot of the stuff in the brain that pops up around social cognition is in what we call the default mode network, which is like the region that's like pretty much always on, right? Uh, it's like, it's constantly driving us towards connection, driving us towards recognition, driving us towards just like being a part of something. And so, I mean, in future episodes, we can dive more into some of these like social neuroscience properties. But um, I think this is a really cool way of like kind of setting the stage and the foundation for like why it matters to look at the social brain. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree completely. Um, now I think you said it well i think um it's it's interesting because we we like kind of think of ourselves as and i think we are like both individuals but also part of this this larger collective and i think that is that is this this fundamental tension about being a human and then um, it shows up in our brains because so much of every brain system has something to do with social um, our, our social selves, like how, how we interact with others. And like, it's really easy to forget that that's actually built into our brains. It's not like just something extra that you happen to live in the society. It's like the reason you live in a society and in a culture and all this, and why you have these feelings about other people is because that's, that's built into your brain. It's, it's part of yeah. like your neural architecture. And I like, I like you using the phrase tension too, because, um, there's this great, great quote kind of in the, the group dynamics literature uh, that said, if an individual's goals and the group's goals were the same, there'd be no difference between individualism and collectivism, right? I, there would be no need for me to give up my individual desires and my individual goals in place of the groups because they're aligned with it, right? And something that would be really interesting to talk about kind of in future episodes is, the, is, is leadership, right? Because I think ultimately what leadership is, is creating that vision creating that idea that like this group is important. The things that we're doing are amazing. Like you should want to be a part of this group. There's a really popular Simon Sinek, start with why, is all based around identity principles, right? There are certain circumstances where if that group is really important to me, if it's really meaningful to me, I am going to shed my personal goals, my personal desires, my personal values in place of that group's goals and desires. Um, and that's been the case throughout history, right? That's how religion operated. That's how most societies tried to organize behavior, right? They're trying to force people into like accepting the group's goals. Like forget about your individuality. Like you are a part of a system, right? 
and like pure individuality, like us actually viewing ourselves as like meaning makers them, is, is a new concept. That's only within the last like hundred years that we've really started to delve into like, how can we prop up the individual side of this and start bringing down the group side a little bit? Yeah, that's really interesting. I remember I, I had this interview with uh, Nicholas Christakis, who is this social scientist. He's also a, a doctor, but um, he talked about how uh, like America, the, the founding of the United States was this really uh, kind of historical revolution because it was like, look, if you look at this problem of of social cohesion, which is basically what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. There are these two different ways of dealing with the, the like uncohesion, the, the, the group tensions that arise. And, um, and it's, you can either go zoom all the way out to the level of the entire nation. And uh, that was part of like what the, the American project was about was making mm -hmm. us all Americans. You're not, yep. you know, it doesn't matter what station in life you came from. Um, although like, obviously at the beginning there was still slavery and a lot of uh, yeah. things that were a problem, but, but in principle, that idea that like all men are created equal, like because we're all Americans, we're all equal, but you can also zoom all the way into the level of the individual and say, well, we're all individuals. We're so fundamentally mm -hmm. like we deserve the same rights. And, and it was like the American project that kind of like put those together in this um, pretty potent mixture that has definitely had its problems and been <laughs> imperfect throughout history, but yeah, yeah. has this really good um, kind of like fusing of those ideas behind it. Because I, I think that that's, that's ultimately what governance is all about, is balancing that tension, is trying to figure out how to allow people to feel like they're important, to feel like they have autonomy, that they have the ability to make choices for themselves, like not forcing conformity on other people, but also having a vision that's strong enough that people actually believe in it. That's what you're talking about. I mean, the American dream was was really strong back then. It was like, I want to be a part of this group and I'm, a pr I'm proud to be a part of this group. And so I am going to be okay signing that social contract. I'm going to be okay, like doing what they want me to, obeying their laws, all of these kind of things. And that's where we're at kind of a crossroads now is trying to figure out where that tension kind of breaks and how we can still kind of respect the individual, but still have this kind of group identity that means something to us. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so, it looks like we're, we're <laughs> nearing our time here. I know you got to get yeah. to a, a lab meeting or something, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yeah. So yeah, research beckons. <laughs> but, nice. Uh, this has been absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm I'm really enjoying this. I'm definitely looking forward to to future episodes. Um, I I want to put it out to our listeners too. Like, if there's anything social or even just about the brain in general that people want to hear about, um, let us know because uh, we're 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 right now we're kind of organizing what our next episodes are going to be. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, this was great. And make sure to uh, to subscribe to both of our channels if you if you feel <laughs> the need. Um, yeah, and I guess we'll be probably back doing another one of these in a, a couple weeks, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Cool. See you, everybody. All right. See you guys.